Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Tonight, let's relax with a classic of philosophy from the Renaissance, In Praise of Folly by Erasmus, illustrated with many curious cuts, designed, drawn, and etched by Hans Holbein, with portrait, Life of Erasmus, and his epistle addressed to Sir Thomas More. In an edition published in 1876 by Reeves and Turner, 196 Strand, W.C. London. Let's begin. The Life of Erasmus Erasmus so deservedly famous for his admirable writings, the vast extent of his learning, his great candor and moderation, and for being one of the chief restorers of the Latin tongue on this side of the Alps, was born at Rotterdam on the 28th of October in the year 1467. The anonymous author of his life, commonly printed with his colloquies, is pleased to tell us that de anno quo natus est apud batavos non constat. And if he himself wrote the life which we find before the Elzevir edition, said to be Erasmo Autore, he does not particularly mention the year in which he was born, but places it circa annum 67 supra millicentum quadringentissimum. Another Latin life, which is prefixed to the above-mentioned London edition, fixes it in the year 1465, as does his epitaph at Basel. But as the inscription on his statue at Rotterdam, the place of his nativity, may reasonably be supposed the most authentic, we have followed that. His mother was the daughter of a physician at Sevenbergen in Holland, with whom his father contracted an acquaintance, and had correspondence with her on promise of marriage, and was actually contracted to her. His father's name was Gerard. He was the youngest of ten brothers, without one sister coming between, for which reason his parents, according to the superstition of the times, designed to consecrate him to the church. His brothers liked the notion, because, as the church then governed all, they hoped if he rose in his profession to have a sure friend to advance their interest. But no importunities could prevail on Gerard to turn ecclesiastic. Finding himself continually pressed upon so disagreeable a subject, and not able longer to bear it, he was forced to fly from his native country, leaving a letter for his friends, in which he acquainted them with the reason of his departure, and that he should never trouble them any more. Thus he left her who was to be his wife big with child, and made the best of his way to Rome. Being an admirable master of the pen, he made a very genteel livelihood by transcribing most authors of note, for printing was not in use. He for some time lived at large, but afterwards applied close to study, made great progress in the Greek and Latin languages and in the civil law, for Rome at that time was full of learned men. When his friends knew he was at Rome, 
they sent him word that the young gentlewoman whom he had courted for a wife was dead, upon which, in a melancholy fit, he took orders and turned his thoughts wholly to the study of divinity. He returned to his own country and found to his grief that he had been imposed upon, but it was too late to think of marriage, so he dropped all further pretensions to his mistress, nor would she after this unlucky adventure be induced to marry. The son took the name of Gerard after his father, which in German signifies amiable, and after the fashion of the learned men of that age, who affected to give their names a Greek or Latin turn, his was turned into Erasmus, which in Greek has the same signification. He was chorister of the Cathedral Church of Utrecht till he was nine years old, after which he was sent to Deventer to be instructed by the famous Alexander Hegius, a Westphalian. Under so able a master, he proved an extraordinary proficient, and it is remarkable that he had such a strength of memory as to be able to say all Terence and Horace by heart. He was now arrived to the thirteenth year of his age, and had been continually under the watchful eye of his mother, who died of the plague then raging at Deventer the contagion daily increasing, and having swept away the family where he boarded, he was obliged to return home. His father Gerard was so concerned at her death that he grew melancholy and died soon after, neither of his parents being much above forty when they died. Erasmus had three guardians assigned him, the chief of whom was Peter Winkle, schoolmaster of Good, and the fortune left him was amply sufficient for his support, if his executors had faithfully discharged their trust. Although he was fit for the university, his guardians were averse to sending him there, as they designed him for a monastic life and therefore removed him to Bois-le-Duc, where he says he lost near three years living in a Franciscan convent. The professor of humanity in this convent, admiring his rising genius, daily importuned him to take the habit and be of their order. Erasmus had no great inclination for the cloister, not that he had the least dislike to the severities of a pious life, but he could not reconcile himself to the monastic profession. He therefore urged his rawness of age and desired farther to consider better of the matter. The plague spreading in those parts, and he having struggled a long time with a court and ague, obliged him to return home. His guardians employed those about him to use all manner of arguments to prevail on him to enter the order of monk, sometimes threatening, and at other times making use of flattery and fair speeches. When Winkle, his guardian, found him not to be moved from his resolution, he told him, that he threw up his guardianship from that moment. Young Erasmus replied that he took him at his word, since he was old enough now to look out for himself. When Winkle found that threats did not avail, he employed his brother, who was the other guardian, to see what he could effect by fair means. Thus he was surrounded by them and their agents on all sides. By mere accident, Erasmus went to visit a religious house belonging to the same order, in Emmaus or Stein near Goud, where
where he met with one Cornelius, who had been his companion at Deventer. And though he had not himself taken the habit, he was perpetually preaching up the advantages of a religious life, as the convenience of noble libraries, the helps of learned conversation, retirement from the noise and folly of the world, and the like. Thus at last he was induced to pitch upon this convent. Upon his admission they fed him with great promises to engage him to take the holy cloth, and though he found almost everything fall short of his expectation, yet his necessities and the usage he was threatened with if he abandoned their order prevailed with him, after his year of probation, to profess himself a member of their fraternity. Not long after this, he had the honor to be known to Henry Abergis, Bishop of Cambrai, who, having some hopes of obtaining a cardinal's hat, wanted one perfectly master of Latin to solicit this affair for him. For this purpose, Erasmus was taken into the bishop's family, where he wore the habit of his order. The bishop, not succeeding in his expectation at Rome, proved fickle and wavering in his affection. Therefore, Erasmus prevailed with him to send him to Paris to prosecute his studies in that famous university, with the promise of an annual allowance which was never paid him. He was admitted into Montague College, but indisposition obliged him to return to the bishop, by whom he was honorably entertained. Finding his health restored, he made a journey to Holland, intending to settle there, but was persuaded to go a second time to Paris, where, having no patron to support him, himself says he rather made a shift to live than could be said to study. He next visited England, where he was received with great respect, and as appears by several of his letters, he honored it next to the place of his nativity. In a letter to Andrelinus, inviting him to England, he speaks highly of the beauty of the English ladies, and thus describes their innocent freedom. When you come into a gentleman's house, you are allowed the favor to salute them, and the same when you take your leave. He was particularly acquainted with Sir Thomas More, Colet, Dean of St. Paul's, Grossinus, Lineker, Latimer, and many others of the most eminent of that time, and passed some years at Cambridge. In his way for France, he had the misfortune to be stripped of everything, but he did not revenge this injury by any unjust reflection on the country. Not meeting with the preferment he expected, he made a voyage to Italy, at that time little inferior to the Augustan age of learning. He took his Doctor of Divinity degree in the University of Turin, stayed about a year in Bologna, afterward went to Venice, and there published his book of adages from the press of the famous Aldus. He removed to Padua, and last to Rome, where his fame had arrived long before him. Here he gained the friendship of all the considerable persons of the city, nor could have failed to have made his fortune, had he not been prevailed upon by the great promises of his friends in England to return thither on Henry the Eighth, coming to the crown. He was taken into favor by Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury, who gave him the living of Aldington in Kent. But whether Erasmus was wanting in making his court to Wolsey, 
or whether the cardinal viewed him with a jealous eye because he was a favorite of Warham, between whom and Wolsey there was perpetual clashing, we know not. However, being disappointed, Erasmus went to Flanders, and by the interest of Chancellor Silvagius, was made counselor to Charles of Austria. Afterward, Charles V, Emperor of Germany. He resided several years at Basel, but on the mass being abolished in that city by the Reformation, he retired to Freiburg in Alsace, where he lived seven years. Having been for a long time afflicted with the gout, he left Freiburg and returned to Basel. Here the gout soon left him, but he was seized by a dysentery, and after laboring a whole month under that disorder, died on the 22nd of July, 1536, in the house of Jerome Frobenius, son of John, the famous printer. He was honorably interred, and the city of Basel still pays the highest respect to the memory of so great a man. Erasmus was the most facetious man and the greatest critic of his age. He carried on a reformation in learning at the same time he advanced that of religion and promoted a purity of style as well as simplicity of worship. This drew on him the hatred of the ecclesiastics, who were no less bigoted to their barbarisms in language and philosophy than they were to their superstitious and gaudy ceremonies in religion. They murdered him in their dull treatises, libeled him in their wretched sermons, and in their last and most effectual efforts of malice, they joined some of their own execrable stuff to his compositions, of which he himself complains in a letter addressed to the divines of Louvain. He exposed with great freedom the vices and corruptions of his own church, yet never would be persuaded to leave her communion. The papal policy would never have suffered Erasmus, to have taken so unbridled a range in the reproof and censure of her extravagancies, but under such circumstances, when the public attack of Luther imposed on her a prudential necessity of not disobliging her friends, that she might with more united strength oppose the common enemy, and patiently bore what at any other time she would have resented. Perhaps no man has obliged the public with a greater number of useful volumes than our author, though several have been attributed to him which he never wrote. His book of colloquies has passed through more editions than any of his others. Morary tells us a bookseller in Paris sold 20,000 at one impression. Erasmus's Praise of Folly, an oration of feigned matter, spoken by folly in her own person. How slightly soever I am esteemed in the common vogue of the world, for I well know how disingenuously folly is decried, even by those who are themselves the greatest fools. Yet it is from my influence alone that the whole universe receives her ferment of mirth and jollity. Of which this may be urged as a convincing argument, in that as soon as I appeared to speak before this numerous assembly, all their countenances were gilded over with a lively, sparkling pleasantness. You soon welcomed me with so encouraging a look, you spurred me on with so cheerful a hum, 
that truly, in all appearance, you seem now flushed with a good dose of reviving nectar, when as just before you sat drowsy and melancholy, as if you were lately come out of some hermit's cell. But as it is usual, that as soon as the sun peeps from her eastern bed, and draws back the curtains of the darksome night, or as when, after a hard winter, the restorative spring breathes a more enlivening air, nature forthwith changes her apparel, and all things seem to renew their age. So at the first sight of me, you all unmask, and appear in more lively colors. That, therefore, which expert orators can scarce affect by all their little artifice of eloquence to wit, a raising the attentions of their auditors to a composedness of thought, this a bare look from me has commanded. The reason why I appear in this odd kind of garb you shall soon be informed of, if for so short a while you will have but the patience to lend me an ear. Yet not such a one as you are wont to hearken with to your reverend preachers, but as you listen withal to mountebanks, buffoons, and merry andrews. In short, such as formerly were fastened to Midas as a punishment for his affront to the god Pan. For I am now in a humor to act a while the sophist, yet not of that sort who undertake the drudgery of tyrannizing over schoolboys and teach a more than womanish knack of brawling, but in imitation of those ancient ones who, to avoid the scandalous epithet of wise, preferred this title of sophists. The task of these was to celebrate the worth of gods and heroes. Prepare, therefore, to be entertained with a panegyric, yet not upon Hercules, Solon, or any other grandee, but on myself, that is, upon folly. And here I value not their censure that pretend it is foppish and affected, for any person to praise himself. Yet let it be as silly as they please, if they will but allow it needful. And indeed, what is more befitting than that folly should be the trumpet of her own praise, and dance after her own pipe? For who can set me forth better than myself? or who can pretend to be so well acquainted with my condition. And yet farther I may safely urge, that all this is no more than the same with what is done by several seemingly great and wise men, who with a new-fashioned modesty employ some paltry orator or scribbling poet, whom they bribe to flatter them, with some high-flown character that shall consist of mere lies and shams. And yet the persons thus extolled shall bristle up and peacock-like bespread their plumes while the impudent parasite magnifies the poor wretch to the skies and proposes him as a complete pattern of all virtues, from each of which he is yet as far distant as heaven itself from hell. What is all this in the meanwhile but the tricking up a daw in stolen feathers, a laboring to change the blackamoor's hue, and the drawing on a pygmy's frock over the shoulders of a giant? Lastly, I verify the old observation that allows him a right of praising himself, who has nobody else to do it for him. For really, I cannot but admire at that ingratitude, shall I term it, 
or blockishness of mankind, who when they all willingly pay to me their utmost devoir, and freely acknowledge their respective obligations, that notwithstanding this, there should have been none so grateful or complacent as to have bestowed on me a commendatory oration, especially when there have not been wanting such as at a great expense of sweat and loss of sleep, have in elaborate speeches given high encomiums to tyrants, agues, flies, baldness, and such like trumperies. I shall entertain you with a hasty and unpremeditated, but so much the more natural discourse. My venting it extempore, I would not have you think proceeds from any principles of vainglory, by which ordinary orators square their attempts, who, as it is easy to observe, when they are delivered of a speech that has been thirty years a conceiving, nay, perhaps at last, none of their own, yet they will swear they wrote it in a great hurry, and upon very short warning, whereas the reason of my not being provided beforehand is only because it was always my humor constantly to speak that which lies uppermost. Next, let no one be so fond as to imagine that I should so far stint my invention to the method of other pleaders as first to define and then divide my subject, i.e. myself. For it is equally hazardous to attempt the crowding her within the narrow limits of a definition whose nature is of so diffusive an extent, or to mangle and disjoin that to the adoration whereof all nations unitedly concur. Beside, to what purpose is it to lay down a definition for a faint resemblance and mere shadow of me, while appearing here personally, you may view me at a more certain light, but why need I have been so impertinent as to have told you this, as if my very looks did not sufficiently betray what I am? Or supposing any be so credulous as to take me for some sage matron or goddess of wisdom, as if a single glance from me would not immediately correct their mistake, while my visage, the exact reflex of my soul would supply and supersede the trouble of any other confessions. For I always appear in my natural colors and an unartificial dress and never let my face pretend one thing and my heart conceal another. Nay, and in all things I am so true to my principles that I cannot be so much as counterfeited, even by those who challenge the name of wits. Yet indeed are no better than jackanapes tricked up in gaudy clothes and asses strutting in lion skins. And how cunningly soever they carry it, their long ears appear and betray what they are. These, in troth, are very rude and disingenuous, for while they apparently belong to my party, yet among the vulgar they are so ashamed of my relation as to cast it in another's dish for a shame and reproach. Wherefore, since they are so eager to be accounted wise, when in truth they are extremely silly, what if to give them their due, I dub them with the title of wise fools? And herein they copy after the example of some modern orators, who swell to that proportion of conceitedness as to vaunt themselves for so many giants of eloquence, 
if with a double-tongued fluency, they can plead indifferently for either side and deem it a very doughty exploit if they can but interlard a Latin sentence with some Greek word, which for seeming garnish they crowd in at a venture, and rather than be at a stand for some cramp words, they will furnish up a long scroll of old obsolete terms out of some musty author, and foist them in to amuse the reader with, that those who understand them may be tickled with the happiness of being acquainted with them, and those who understand them not, the less they know, the more they may admire. Whereas it has always been a custom to those of our side to condemn and undervalue whatever is strange and unusual, while those that are better conceited of themselves will nod and smile and prick up their ears that they may be thought easily to apprehend that of which perhaps they do not understand one word. And so much for this. Pardon the digression. Now I return. Of my name I have informed you, sirs, what additional epithet to give you, I know not. Except you will be content with that of most foolish, for under what more proper appellation can the goddess Folly greet her devotees? But since there are few acquainted with my family and original, I will now give you some account of my extraction. First, then, my father was neither the Chaos, nor Hell, nor Saturn, nor Jupiter, nor any of those old, worn-out, grandsire gods, but Plutus, the very same that, Maugre Homer, Hesiod, nay, in spite of Jove himself, was the primary father born amongst these delights. I did not, like other infants, come crying into the world, but perked up and laughed immediately in my mother's face. And there is no reason I should envy Jove for having a she-goat to his nurse, since I was more creditably suckled by two jolly nymphs. The name of the first, Drunkenness, one of Bacchus's offspring, the other, Ignorance, the daughter of Pan, both which you may here behold among several others of my train and attendants, whose particular names, if you would fain know, I will give you in short. This, who goes with a mincing gait and holds up her head so high, is self-love, she that looks so spruce and makes such a noise and bustle is flattery. The other, which sits humdrum as if she were half asleep, is called forgetfulness. She that leans on her elbow and sometimes yawningly stretches out her arms is laziness. This that wears a plighted garland of flowers and smells so perfumed is pleasure. The other, which appears in so smooth a skin and pampered up flesh, is sensuality. She that stares so wildly and rolls about her eyes is madness. As to those two gods who you see playing among the lasses, the name of the one is intemperance, the other sound sleep. By the help and service of this retinue, I bring all things under the verge of my power, lording it over the greatest kings and potentates. You have now heard of my descent, my education, and my attendance. 
that I may not be taxed as presumptuous in borrowing the title of a goddess, I come now in the next place to acquaint you what obliging favors I everywhere bestow, and how largely my jurisdiction extends. For if, as one has ingenuously noted, to be a god is no other than to be a benefactor to mankind, and if they have been thought deservedly deified who have invented the use of wine, corn, or any other convenience for the well-being of mortals, why may not I justly bear the van among the whole troop of gods, who in all and toward all exert an unparalleled bounty and beneficence? For instance, in the first place, what can be more dear and precious than life itself? and yet for this are none beholden save to me alone. For it is neither the spear of thoroughly begotten Pallas, nor the buckler of cloud-gathering Jove that multiplies and propagates mankind, but my sportive and tickling recreation that preceded the old crabbed philosophers and those who now supply their stead the mortified monks and friars, as also kings, priests, and popes, nay, the whole tribe of poetic gods, who are at last grown so numerous, as in the camp of heaven, though ne'er so spacious, to jostle for elbow room. But it is not sufficient to have made it appear that I am the source and original of all life. Except I likewise show that all the benefits of life are equally at my disposal. And what are such? Why can anyone be said properly to live to whom pleasure is denied? You will give me your assent for there is none I know among you so wise, shall I say, or so silly as to be of a contrary opinion. The Stoics indeed condemn and pretend to banish pleasure, but this is only a dissembling trick, and a putting the vulgar out of conceit with it, that they may more quietly engross it to themselves but I dare them now to confess what one stage of life is not melancholy, dull, tiresome, tedious, and uneasy, unless we spice it with pleasure, that hout-ghost of folly. Of the truth whereof, the never-enough-to-be-commended Sophocles is sufficient authority, who gives me the highest character in that sentence of his, to know nothing is the sweetest life. Yet, abating from this, let us examine the case more narrowly. Who knows not that the first scene of infancy is far the most pleasant and delightsome, what then is it in children that makes us so kiss, hug, and play with them, and that the bloodiest enemy can scarce have the heart to hurt them, but their ingredients of innocence and folly, of which nature out of providence did purposely compound and blend their tender infancy? That by a frank return of pleasure, they might make some sort of amends for their parents' trouble, and give in caution, as it were, for the discharge of a future education. The next advance from childhood is youth, and how favorably is this dealt with! How kind, courteous, and respectful are all to it! and how ready to become serviceable upon all occasions. And whence reaps it this happiness? Whence indeed, but from me only, 
by whose procurement it is furnished with little of wisdom, and so with the less of disquiet. And when once lads begin to grow up and attempt to write man, their prettiness does the soon decay, their briskness flags, their humors stagnate, their jollity ceases, and their blood grows cold. And the farther they proceed in years, the more they grow backward in the enjoyment of themselves, till waspish old age comes on, a burden to itself as well as others, and that so heavy and oppressive as none would bear the weight of, unless out of pity to their sufferings, I again intervene and lend a helping hand, assisting them at a dead lift. In the same method the poets feign their gods to succor dying men by transforming them into new creatures, which I do by bringing them back, after they have one foot in the grave, to their infancy again. So as there is a great deal of truth couched in that old proverb, once an old man and twice a child. Now if anyone be curious to understand what course I take to effect this alteration, my method is this. I bring them to my well of forgetfulness, the fountain whereof is in the fortunate islands, and the river Lethe in hell but a small stream of it. And when they have filled their bellies full, and washed down care by the virtue and operation whereof, they become young again. I but say you, they merely dote, and play the fool. Why, yes, this is what I mean by growing young again. For what else is it to be a child than to be a fool and an idiot? It is the being such that makes that age so acceptable. For who does not esteem it somewhat ominous to see a boy endowed with the discretion of a man? And therefore, for the curbing of two forward parts, we have a disparaging proverb, soon ripe, soon rotten. And farther, who would keep company or have anything to do with such an old blade, as after the wear and harrowing of so many years, should yet continue of as clear a head and sound a judgment as he had at any time been in his middle age, and therefore it is great kindness of me that old men grow fools, since it is hereby only that they are freed from such vexations as would torment them if they were more wise. They can drink briskly, bear up stoutly, and lightly pass over such infirmities as a far stronger constitution could scarce master. Sometime, with the old fellow in Plautus, they are brought back to their hornbook again, to learn to spell their fortune in love. Most wretched would they needs be if they had but wit enough to be sensible of their hard condition but by my assistance they carry off all well, and to their respective friends approve themselves good, sociable, jolly companions. Thus Homer makes aged Nestor, famed for a smooth, oily-tongued orator, while the delivery of Achilles was but rough, harsh, and hesitant, and the same poet elsewhere, tells us of old men that sat on the walls, and spake with a great deal of flourish and elegance. And in this point indeed, they surpass and outgo children, who are pretty forward, 
in a softly innocent prattle, but otherwise are too much tongue-tied, and want the other's most acceptable embellishment of a perpetual talkativeness. And to this, that old men love to be playing with children, and children delight as much in them, to verify the proverb that birds of a feather flock together. And indeed, what difference can be discerned between them but that the one is more furrowed with wrinkles, and has seen a little more of the world than the other? For otherwise their whitish hair, their want of teeth, their smallness of stature, their milk diet, their bald crowns, their prattling, their playing, their short memory, their heedlessness, and all their other endowments exactly agree. And the more they advance in years, the nearer they come back to their cradle, till like children indeed, at last they depart the world without any remorse at the loss of life or sense of the pangs of death. And now, let anyone compare the excellency of my metamorphosing power to that which Ovid attributes to the gods. Their strange feats in some drunken passions we will omit for their credit's sake and instance only in such persons as they pretend great kindness for. These they transformed into trees, birds, insects, and sometimes serpents. But alas, their very change into somewhat else argues the destruction of what they were before. Whereas I can restore the same numerical man to his pristine state of youth, health, and strength. Yea, what is more, if men would but so far consult their own interest as to discard all thoughts of wisdom and entirely resign themselves to my guidance and conduct, old age should be a paradox, and each man's years a perpetual spring for look how your hard plodding students, by a close, sedentary confinement to their books, grow mopish, pale, and meager, as if by a continual rack of brains and torture of invention, their veins were pumped dry and their whole body squeezed sapless. Whereas my followers, are smooth, plump, and buxom, and altogether as lusty as so many bacon hogs or sucking calves, never in their career of pleasure to be arrested with old age. If they could but keep themselves untainted from the contagiousness of wisdom, with the leprosy whereof, if at any time they are infected, it is only for prevention, lest they should otherwise have been too happy. For a more ample confirmation of the truth of what foregoes, it is on all sides confessed that folly is the best preservative of youth and the most effectual antidote against age. And it is a never-failing observation made of the people of Brabant, that contrary to the proverb of older and wiser, the more ancient they grow, the more fools they are. And there is not any one country whose inhabitants enjoy themselves better and rub through the world with more ease and quiet. To these are nearly related as well by affinity of customs as of neighborhood, my friends, the Hollanders. Mine I may well call them, for they stick so close and lovingly to me that they are styled fools to a proverb, 
and yet scorn to be ashamed of their name. Well, let fond mortals go now in a needless quest of some Medea, Circe, Venus, or some enchanted fountain for a restorative of age, whereas the accurate performance of this feat lies only within the ability of my art and skill. It is I only who have the receipt of making that liquor wherewith Memnon's daughter lengthened out her grandfather's declining days. It is I that am that Venus, who so far restored the languishing Phaon as to make Sappho fall deeply in love with his beauty. Mine are those herbs, mine those charms, that not only lure back swift time when past and gone, but what is more to be admired, clip its wings and prevent all further flight. So then, if you will all agree to my verdict, that nothing is more desirable than the being young, nor anything more loathed than contemptible old age, you must needs acknowledge it as an unrequitable obligation from me for fencing off the one and perpetuating the other. And that seems as good a place as any to end this evening's reading from In Praise of Folly by Erasmus. That was some pretty complicated reading, but there are some wonderful ideas in here, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, I'll leave a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. The description also includes links to ways you can support this podcast and keep it ad-free for everyone, including dropping a one-time tip on buymeacoffee.com or becoming a member of our Patreon, where you'll get exclusive episodes heard nowhere else. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. If you'd like to connect or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.